going on this week, most notably that on um, Wednesday, your situation analysis is due, right? And marketing goals are due. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look at that. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, and go ahead and send me those. Those we um, most. Yep. Got it. Okay. Go ahead and send those questions in. Um, so yeah. So let me just quickly go over all the the things to do this week. Um, so watch videos one through three on week eight and this week um, when we're talking about it. So for for week eight, we're primarily um, talking about website design. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff out there that's going to help you with um, not only how to think about website design, but also some tools for how to prototype website uh, for content for your uh, group marketing project, right? Uh, so definitely pay attention to that, especially the one on the Wix tutorial. Then, uh, you know, another big component is, as I mentioned, big, big component. Wow, I'm having trouble talking. Big component of what is due in week eight is to turn in your situation analysis and marketing goals, right? Um, I'd also like you to read the new reading on Pinterest, social media, and anti-vaxxers and answer the questions on Top Hat. Um, and then there's a mid-course survey, and it's hard to kind of give it to you here, but if you go to the Moodle, there's a link to it. There's a Google form uh, that links directly to uh, the mid-course survey. Um, and so if you could, that'd be great for you to kind of fill that out um, and uh, kind of give me some answers on the mid-course survey as to how you think you're doing. I, I do this every year, um, and I do it kind of as a, um, using what's called the uh, start, stop, keep doing kind of framework. And so what it is is it asks three simple questions. Is there anything I could do that would, um, that I'm not doing that would improve your learning? Is there something I'm doing that is hindering your learning? And what am I doing that is helping your learning currently, right? Uh, so if you can answer that, I really take those comments into effect. And sometimes I can't adjust this year's course to it, but I can adjust future years. And I definitely have adapted the course over the years on the basis of the results of that survey. Um, and of course, for the optional components, make sure and read Chapter 6, um, which is related to website design. Okay? Um, yeah. So let's also... And so, and then but the one other thing I was going to mention... Uh, yeah, no, that's that's it for this week, right? Um, in the previous week, I was going to mention, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things um, reading today, Complex Network of Things. And there are two readings, there are two optional links in there that I wanted to mention to you. One is the one from a, a podcast I really like called The Darknet Diaries that does a lot of examination of the dark side of the web. And it talks about how um, a whole bunch of printers got hacked at one point uh, to just start spewing forth uh, content, right? Uh, so if you want, I highly recommend listening to that story. It's just kind of intriguing. I feel like a lot of the stories in Doctor and Diaries um, could be like riveting documentaries or something as well. But uh, anyways, take a listen to that. Um, and the other one is I did link directly to the Shodan, Shodan IoT search engine. That kind of is kind of cool because it allows you to directly search all the kind of stuff going on on the Internet of Things. And it's kind of going to bring up an example um, so I can show you, um, let's see, where's the one I was going to bring up? I'm trying to pull it up here on my computer before I flip over and make sure I have the right one. Oh, that's not the right one. Hold on, still working on it. Give me a second. Um. No. Okay. I know this is riveting TV. I'm trying to find it. If I can't find it shortly, I will just show you what you can find from it.
So just as a quick example, let me pull this over. Right? I don't know who this is. I don't know anything about this person, right? But there's a lot of unsecured IoT out there, and this is kind of talking about that security example. Um, and this person has an IP camera that I just found by looking on Shodan and Googling webcams. And I was able to find a webcam that has no security set on it whatsoever. And anybody can connect to it um, and kind of just look into what's going on. And so um, I just typed in webcam into the search engine, right? This one is somewhere in Brazil, right? Um, and if I click through to the actual website, right? Um, let me turn off my own thing. I always call it some flickering. Hold on. Um, what you can see is I actually have full control over this camera, right? So I can adjust like the audio on it. I can adjust um, what's going on. I'm not going to touch any of these controls because I feel like that would be malicious for me to do so. In fact, I'm going to screen out the IP number so you can't see it. You might have already grabbed it, but um, um, but you know this this you know essentially allows me to get full control over this camera. In fact, I can even look at their video archive, right? to see what videos they recorded in the past, right? Um, and so it's it's kind of, you know, one of those things that I think we really need to be aware of, right? I am not, you know, someone who deliberately would try and hurt anyone's controls, right? But, you know, the fact that this person has what looks to be a camera set up inside their house and has no security on it whatsoever is, is very worrisome, right? And that's one of the things that I highlight in the article, the Complex Network of Things that I mentioned is that the security protocols on these things are a lot more difficult. The other annoying thing about it, right, in general, is that even if I do a good job of securing my internal network, but I leave one small hole open like this one, right, then people can hop from one connection to another. So uh, a lot of devices that we have in our homes will trust the um, other devices that are on the same network, right? Um, like a lot of the Google devices, for instance, do that, right? And so if someone, if a, if a, if a adversary can get access to a connection like a webcam, they may be able to ask that webcam through a variety of methods to make requests to other devices at home, right? So just a little thing, you know, I think Shodan's just interesting to show people because it kind of shows you how much is exposed out there already. Right. Um, now, you know, what does all that have to do with marketing? All right, let's talk about that. So, um, you know, I think that the big point that I was trying to make when I wrote this article originally is that marketing is very much, the marketers really need to be aware of this, of these things when they start to use Internet of Things branded devices, right? And you might say, well, my company's never going to do that. But that's not a good solution, right? Because as we know from like the Amazon search ads, from other stuff that's going on, from voice ads, right? The truth of the matter is that a lot of consumers' interaction with the Internet of Things, with, with the marketplace in general in the future, is going to be mediated by the Internet of Things, right? And so the, you can't just bury your head in the sand and say, well, we're not going to use the Internet of Things, right? You need to be there, or at least you need to be able to be accessible through the Internet of Things, Right, which means that all these concerns about security uh, and the complexity of the systems um, need to be in every marketer's mind. Right, so hopefully in this class, that's one thing that kind of I've kind of tried to illustrate to you is that how important it is to be aware of these complex topics that may at first seem like they have nothing to do with marketing, uh, but as we go on looking at them, actually kind of are are related in many ways. Okay, so let's talk through. The actual reading that we did. Let me pull that up. Okay. Turn that one on. Turn this one off. Alright, okay. Get a little bigger. Uh, okay. So, this reading is called the Complex Network of Things. And the reason why it's called that is because. I'm a big fan of studying complex systems, and complex systems is a good way to look at the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is not a monolithic system. It's not like a TV ad where you put it together, you put it on TV, and you broadcast it out to other people, right? The complex systems are systems composed of many, many interacting parts, right? 
And one way you could think of it is that in, 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 those, in those interactions of those parts give rise to the full system, right? And instead of the outcome of the system being a simple result, right? It's an emergent result of all those different interacting parts. And those interacting parts then feed back to affect the individual systems. Um, and these systems as a result cannot really be controlled, uh, but you can try to guide them. So the classic example I give in this space, especially with the IoT paradigm, is the taxi cab system versus Uber, right? So taxi cabs were an attempt to use a monolithic control device to control what was going on uh, in terms of transportation, right? Um, it was an attempt uh, by these different companies to really say, um, you know, there's only one controller of vehicular transport in the city. And they did it a lot through the use of these shields, right, what they would give out to the taxi cabs. And these shields became very hard to get. And if you didn't have a shield, you couldn't run your, your taxi cab. So Uber comes along, right, and Uber says, well, why does it have to be that way? You know, why can't anybody just contact anybody else with a car and get a ride from one place to another? And the reason why, so in the past, you need the centralized system because of the fact that um, no one had, could trust the reputation of just a random person who showed up on the front doorstep of a car, right? But with the advent of reputation systems and the ability uh, for anybody to connect to anybody else via this common platform of Uber who would kind of regulate everything, or kind of not regulate in the sense of legislation, but regulate in the sense of control, right, everything, you could um, give people this ability, right? And as a result, right, I would argue that the complex system of urban transportation was trying to be controlled by the New York City taxi cab system and it basically broke apart, right? Now it lasted for a very long time. They were able to control this complex system for a long time, mainly because there was no way for the parts, the individual users, to really interact well, right? Um, but then once, you know, the popularity of smartphones, GPS-based uh, communication, right, and these kind of tools came along, then they had systems that could interact. And at that point, it's really hard Control and even Uber, I would argue, does not control it, but merely guides uh, the transportation system. Uber and Lyft and the guides. So small elements of the system can affect the whole system. That's one of the learnings from complex systems, right? The small elements can often change and, and alter other things, right? Um, and these elements don't control the system because often their effects are not intentional, but they can have side effects, right? So there's this great story, and I highly recommend you go and watch uh, the YouTube video. In fact, I'll put the, this YouTube video up online um, on the Moodle. I keep forgetting to add it as part of the Moodle content. Um, but I'll do it immediately after this office hour. Right? But in this video, basically, it shows how some, some white hat hackers, these are security experts, were able to gain control of uh, some GMC cars. Right? Um, and they did it by um, kind of faking an update to the radio system of the car, which you think, no big deal. What a, well, who cares if they control the radio? But the radio is on the same bus as every other component of the system. And so as a result, the, they could get the radio to send signals to things like the driving system, right? The engine system. And so they, in fact, in the video, they turn off the engine in the middle of a highway, right? Of a car, right? Uh, and so it kind of gets... Um, somewhat disastrous. Now, these small elements, right, sometimes these changes can be beneficial. It's possible, right, that they are not uh, horrible, right, but instead beneficial. Uh, but a lot of times, um, they often are disastrous. Um, so, in every complex system, gatekeepers are important. If you can't get on to the network, right, if you can't get on to the controlling aspect, then you can't talk to the consumer, right? If the consumer is primarily getting all their information through their smart watch and their uh, smart refrigerator and their tablet, right? If you can't be there, you can't be there. You can't, you can't talk to them. I mean, think about like someone who is trying to talk to you on the internet, right? Uh, trying to get you to come to their website, but, for, but Google wouldn't let you talk to them, right? So that means that these consumer-facing smart devices, the smartphone, the home hubs, the watches, they're going to be even more powerful in the future. And so... What's going to be really important is who is control of those devices, right? Because otherwise you can't talk to the consumer. And right now, you know, it's um, Google and Apple, 
uh, primarily have, have kind of locked up uh, most of these devices, right? Um, and so it'll be interesting to see, um, with Microsoft kind of playing some role there, it'll be interesting to see as that continues, right, how much you'll need to continually talk to them, right? Because Google obviously has the Nest products, Apple has the Home products, Oh, Amazon also has the Alexa products, right? That was the other one I was thinking about. Um, so I was like, talk about the third one, right? So Google, Apple, and Amazon, right, all control this conversation. Now, one other lesson that we've learned from the complex systems that we can apply to the Internet of Things is that you should embrace uncertainty, right? In a lot of cases, consumers are going to use this network in ways that we never intended, right? Um, and the final applications, the best uses of, say, Alexa have not yet been decided, right? Um, even the original IoT device actually was a, a slightly different way. So this is the X coffee machine. Um, it was a system that was built, right, to basically just show a bunch of researchers whether or not a coffee pot was empty, <laughs> right? And, and this is built back in the 1990s, right? It was essentially a webcam facing a coffee pot, and that way you could tell if there was coffee available or not without having to get out of your seat to go look. I would argue in some ways that this is the first Internet of Thing device, right? Because it was, you know, webcams obviously existed. It wasn't invented for this use, right? Uh, but it was the first time that, like, useful information could be retrieved by multiple people from one device, right? So I think that's a really interesting example of, uh, the Internet of Things. And I, that was not what was intended, right? When people built webcams, they meant them from, like, talking to each other across long distances, not for monitoring coffee pots. Right? So that's kind of a quick rundown on uh, the Internet of Things. Um, by the way, if you're watching online and you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to speak up, um, type them into YouTube. I'm going to be wrapping up shortly, so I want to give you a chance. Um, so, um, again, just to kind of talk about what we mentioned, you know, for this class, I'd like you to make sure, for this week, I'd like you to make sure you turn in your situation analysis and marketing goals. That's probably the primary and most important aspect. Uh, read the new reading on Pinterest, social media, and anti-vaxxers. Make sure you watch the videos in week eight. Uh, fill out the mid-course survey, which is linked to on the Moodle, and uh, read chapter six if you want. Uh, other than that, that's about it for this week. One small look ahead to next week. So you're going to turn in your situation analysis on Wednesday, and then next Wednesday you're going to receive your analytical assignment. And I recommend that we receive, and you're going to have two weeks to work on that, so you're going to have the time over spring break, right? Um, so really it's a week minus spring break, which is makes it you know two weeks minus one week, one week, right? Uh, but if you want to use spring break, you can use it. It's completely up to you. Um, Especially since you're in the online class, spring break's probably not as big of a deal to you as uh, some of the other times. But I won't be doing office hours during spring break, right? Um, so we'll, we'll be treating it just like um, the offline, the seated class, if you will. Um, so anyway, so that is coming up. So your situation analysis due this Wednesday, and then next Wednesday you get your analytical assignment. That's really all I have for this week. Make sure you turn in uh, your... Um, uh, uh, to talking to you all in a couple of weeks. Take care.